sports flowing in their veins. Mackie and Judd on Score North and scorenorth.com. It blows my mind. Cover the back 10. You know, make sure you have the goal line covered and worry about the back part of the end zone, the, the rest of the end zone, if the ball goes up in the air. I, I, I was... I, he, I, I could believe him being stunned. He, he'd have to think, this isn't right. I'm going to hook up here in the end zone, and there's nobody near me. I, I, I still, I just watched that replay and can't believe what I saw. Cannot believe what I saw. And you saw Danzler, and they, got, they just kind of looked at each other like, wow. <laughs> Almost like they can't believe it happened either. That was stunning, stunningly bad defense. G- Mike Golick, back, just <laughs> delivering takes on pro football talk. It's great to see him back. It is. it is. He's great. So what's he doing? So he's doing like some sort of, I think he's doing like some radio color commentary for some football games. I'm, yeah, I think Golik, so. Golik, man. 20 years of Golik takes. Yeah. Um, that was stunningly bad defense at the end of that game against the Lions. The defense was so bad. We are officially going to go there today on Mackie and Judd. Daily Minnesota Sports Entertainment Therapy and coaching searches <laughs> unless you guys disagree i think we should start the show today with an article from sportsillustrated.com si.com offensive minded head coach candidates and this isn't specifically tailored to the vikings but i have sort of taken the ones this 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 article has all head coaching candidates i have stripped out the offensive minded ones and i will deliver them to you guys you good okay. you guys yeah. good with this yeah, oh okay. yeah i just want to make sure that we're all sort of turning oh. the page here the Wilts, the Mike Zimmer era. Why shouldn't we? Seriously. Well, they haven't yet. Well, no, but they're looking you know at they have? They're, they're looking at the set. I told you last week. Are you they reporting? Are, they are, <laughs> I told you guys this last week. This is not new news. Now, I said that they are doing, uh, I've heard they're quietly doing due diligence on coaching and GM candidates. So this is what we're doing. Like, just because it's this is going to be on our podcast and it's public, This is still a quiet, like, look. Like, you're not, you're going to give us six names. Yes. So this is the same thing. Let's do this. Actually, I I lied. It's seven names. Oh, my God. It's seven offensive-minded head coach candidates. You're vetting the process, Phil Mackey. Mm -hmm. You're you're, you're vetting. So let's, uh, I'm going to throw these names out, and I'm going to read you a couple of excerpts from the article, too. Mm -hmm. And let's, let's just score all of these. One to ten, like a ten being, a ten being, uh, like Bill Belichick. If Bill Belichick is about to be the head coach of your football team, excited, and a one being like, um, like, like they're bringing Leslie Frazier back or something. I don't know, just for whatever. They're bringing uh, Brad Brad Childress back. You're just not very excited. Although I think Brad Childress gets a bad rap, but that's fine. So you'll you'll give me a one to ten number on this one first. Forty one year old. Nathaniel Hackett, the Packers offensive coordinator. Before you give me your number, here's the write-up. Hackett has a trajectory that includes massive offensive turnarounds at nearly every stop. At Syracuse, he turned a downtrodden program's offense into one of the nation's leaders and established quarterback Ryan Nassib as a draft prospect. In Buffalo, he helped turn a sub-500 team into a 9-7 and outfit with a respectable offense. And in Jacksonville, he designed an offense for Blake Bortles that finished 5th in points per game and sixth in yards, and none of this even counts the work that he's done in Green Bay, which is combining his expertise in both outside zone and his roots in the West Coast offense with Aaron Rodgers and getting that thing to click. So Nathaniel Hackett, what's your 1 through 10 score? Uh, Like That kind of excites me. First off, probably important to point out that he does not call plays in Green Bay, but what okay. you read is impressive. So so he's not currently calling plays, but clearly has experience, and, and it's not like he has um, spent his whole career being on the coattails of other people. My number on Nathaniel Hackett is a, is a five to start with. Um, <clears throat> I think the Wilfs would be about a seven or so. Um, I think the Packers' success intrigues them. I think that they are always trying to look for, like, the secret sauce of of the teams that the Vikings compete against. Yeah. Uh, I think in their mind, h- hiring Hackett away from the Packers would hurt the Packers. So I, I'm going to go five, but I think that that's a name that you should probably keep an eye on as far as being a real candidate here. To me, it's a three. 
Uh, I, I'm not really too impressed of what you did with Blake Bortles. I like I understand why that could be impressive, given that he's a mostly pretty bad quarterback, and you milked a lot out of that cow. But I I don't really get too excited about it. I can be convinced. Judd brings up a good point that they the Wilfs sometimes to be seem to be obsessed with their competition and how they're performing and what they're doing. So I could be maybe talked into it, and I wouldn't be like upset if there's an interview there. But he doesn't do anything to me that jumps off the page. Yeah, I'm like a five. I'm like a five. I th- it's really hard when you're hiring someone who is so closely associated with Aaron Rodgers or other great quarterbacks. You know, that's how Adam Gase gets a head coaching job because he would look, look at those Broncos offenses with Peyton Manning. It's like, well, I mean, Judd, <laughs> Judd could have been the offensive coordinator. <laughs> Here, Peyton, here's a Gatorade. Yeah, but it would have bothered me because the ball was fly- I would have been, Peyton, put some damn zip on that ball or retire. <laughs> Get out of the game. Um, and, and didn't the Giants, so the Giants head coach who looked like a gym teacher had been the Packers quarterback's coach, right? Looked like it's Joe, the same. Uh, not, uh, Joe Philbin. Joe Philbin. No, no, yeah, him, him too. But the guy, no, he the also guy looks that like looked a gym like teacher. A, the, the guy that, the guy that coached the, Gi- the guy that coached the Giants, I can't remember his name but he looked like a gym teacher and i think yeah, the was, mustache guy yeah so i think he was the quarterbacks coach in green bay and it was the same sort sort of thing where oh my god he must know a lot and then he started like yeah not really yeah so, so that's like a five all right candidate number two 46 year old brian dable offensive coordinator buffalo bills so he comes from the Bill Belichick and Nick Saban coaching trees. The Belichick yeah. coaching tree was a disaster for a long time. It's getting better now. Yeah, it works. It's getting better. Uh, Dabble yeah. continues to cement his status as an offensive mastermind capable of creating mismatches anywhere on the field. His role in the development of Josh Allen has been overlooked, although the football world got a small taste of his quarterback acumen after watching Mitch Trubisky carve up his former team in the preseason once. Uh, he has an eye for matchups that can transcend scheme, which is a gift few offensive coaches possess. Oh, God. He seems to, I mean, he's done a really good job. The tree he comes th- uh, from really scares me because it has so many colossal flops. And the other problem is, and th- this is going to be a problem with most of the names that you read, we don't know a lot about them as people. So, like, can they lead? Can they? That's the hardest part. Because, yeah. it's, because it's not like, well, he's an offensive genius. So he's going, like, part of the problem with Mike is Mike Mike sees himself as so one-dimensional that, that you don't have a guy who you feel can lift up the entire room, which is incredibly important. Uh, I'm going to put this at a six i think it's higher than hackett but there are red flags here that that i would need to know a lot more about him as about dable as a person so i'm going to say a six because he has done some impressive things it's a five for me i fired his ass on purple daily already this year so i i I have have trepidations just automatically making him the vikings head coach and something's getting stale in buffalo i don't know if that's coaching i don't know if that's other teams scheming differently but that offensive shine with Josh Allen has started to wear off a little bit and doesn't look as dangerous as it did at the beginning of 2020. And even for the first five games of 2021, teams are starting to figure them out a little bit. And I don't know if Dable has the adjustments to all of a sudden click it back and make it worthwhile. Buffalo could go on a run here in the next month of the season before it ends and, and figure things out and make get hot in the playoffs. To me, it's a five. Worth an interview for sure. It, like wait, Definitely worth over Hackett. But I don't know if I'm all in on him. It's like a six for me. I, I I think for Buffalo's purposes, to your point, it it feels a little stale. It feels a little finesse. You know, they don't run the ball all that well. They love to throw. It feels like if Buffalo were a dome team, an indoor track meet team, this is one thing, sort of a side street here. If the Vikings had decided to build an outdoor stadium a few years ago and fully embrace the elements and the wind and the cold, the conditions, and say, you know what, we're going to build our football team for November, December. We're going to run the ball, play defense, play Mike Zimmer football. And that's going to be the identity of our franchise. The Pittsburgh Steelers run first. They got away from that for a couple of years, but we're going to run the ball, play defense. I would say, awesome, cool. Like Maybe even get a defensive-minded coach to do that. But it's almost like the Vikings have gotten away from what really makes them tick the most the last 30 years, which is offense. The best Viking seasons 
have been offensive-driven track meet teams, right? 1998 through 2000. They go to two NFC championship games. In your lifetime, yeah. Yes, you're right. But but in the 70s, they played outside in the elements. Right. Since they came inside, and they're still inside for another 20 or 30 years, Mm -hmm. I think a guy like Brian, uh, is it Dable or Dabble? Dable. I thought it was Dable. I thought it was Dable. Brian Dable. I thought it was Brian Dable. Brian Dable. Brian Dable. That's what I thought. I mean, we could be wrong, but, you know, Bills fans, you can correct us. We're going to go Dable. We're not above Um, that. I think if he were to bring his aerial attack, sort of that track meet, fun ball style to U.S. Bank Stadium, it would be a blast. And so I'm actually talking myself into like a higher score. I'll I'll just, I'll keep it at a six, though. All right. 52-year-old Eric Biennemi, offensive coordinator, Kansas City Chiefs, and also former Vikings running backs coach. For Adrian Peterson about 14 years ago. I've been pretty high on him consistently for the last few years. And and the Chiefs are sort of weird now. Like their their defense now has, has gone from being terrible early in the season to being good. Their offense isn't what it once was, but that's really not shocking because eventually they were go- going to be slowed down. And Tampa Bay probably gave teams sort of a blueprint. Uh, but I'm gonna put the enemy at I'm gonna put the enemy at a six two. Um I can't go, I can't go super high there um i think he deserves a chance i guess my i guess my concern is not does he know not would would he be good offensively i guess my concern is uh the staff that he would surround himself with but i think he would do a good job i'll i'll say this unless he's changed the man is wired tight like he's gonna he's an intense dude uh but i'll but i'll go a six bordering on a seven he intrigues me I think no. He roams the sidelines, right? He's not a nope. I think he, yes. I think he's yes. he's on the sidelines. Right? Yes. So I did okay. see okay. him and him and Mahomes were barking at each. And he's this super, is the type of coach he is. Like strong. he'd get into Peterson. He was well, Peterson getting into Mahomes. By the end, he and Peterson had throwdowns. It was great. Do you think? And let me read the write up here. So it all seems to be in the eye of the beholder as to why Bieniemy is not an NFL head coach right now. It's not responsible to sit here and disseminate anonymous tidbits about certain interviews that may have gone one way or another and why that justifies an owner's decision. But the reality is, at some point, some team will give Biennemi a chance. He is, at the moment, the face of the NFL's racial hiring disparity. Every time a report emerges about why he may not be a head coach, there are white coaches who seem to get jobs in spite of those same perceived drawbacks, which is a very fair point. Yes. Um... I wonder because he he is he is very much like, like like I told you I was watching part of that Chiefs game over the weekend, and he was barking at Mahomes and Mahomes is snapping back and him and Peterson would get into each other's. He doesn't care if you're Pat Mahomes or a backup fullback, like he'll get into someone. Correct. And so I do wonder: is there an abrasive quality to his personality that works better as a position coach or a coordinator, but might not be shelf life guy as a coach? Now I'm just speculating because it is interesting. Why doesn't he have a job yet? I right. mean, he's been out there for like well, three years. And this is so difficult because that's a legit concern. Like you can't, you can't ride players constantly now. Like, you you know, in 1976, you, you certainly could. You can't do that now. I think you get the most from them. Uh, but the, but the, how does a guy interview talker bothers me? Cause like that, that's what held Zimmer back because he was abrasive and told the truth, which is what you really should want. And, and like, I've never been convinced that these billionaire owners like can identify what football players are going to want, right? Like, oh, he, you know, I, he didn't come off. Po- I mean, what's polished? Like, okay, so you're super polished, but but that could mean that you're just a fraud. Um, so I mean, Bill I've always, Belichick's not very polished, <laughs> right? But but like I've always struggled with this thing. Well, seven teams said he was too abrasive. Yeah, but are those the people that I want telling me what's what? So so like I do think it's important that you think the guy can coexist with his players. That's super important. Yeah. But this whole thing of are billionaires impressed enough? Is he polished enough? Uh, I do think this on the Wilfs. I do think. They are going to want a coach, unfortunately, I guess in some ways, who is more polished because I think the way that Mike treats the media rubs the Wilfs the wrong way. I'm not saying that's a right perception to take. I'm saying I've heard that they are somewhat embarrassed sometimes because Mike can get so petulant. Yeah. 
So you're a six. Definitely. Yep. What about you? The enemy's a seven. Like he he's got the resume. He's familiar with the organization. The reason I have trepidations is not because he hasn't had the opportunities necessarily. It's because the dude loves to establish the run. Like he's a running backs coach. He's he's gonna want to come here, come in here and say Dalvin Cook is gonna be our offense. And it's important to acknowledge that Dalvin Cook exists. There's no doubt about that. He's a special, talented player. I worry that the Vikings are going to still be stuck in an old-school mindset with him at the head coach. That's my kind of fear of it. I could be talked into it because he's he's dealt with Patrick Mahomes, and that Chiefs offense is obviously a pass-first offense, so I don't think it's like he's completely against not throwing the football. I just have maybe a little bit too con- too much concerns about him being a running backs coach for basically his entire tenure uh, in the NFL and in college, that he's going to want to just come in here and establish the run and keep it old school. Yeah, I'm a, I'm like a five. I def- I definitely wouldn't hate the hire. I just, I guess I just wonder why hasn't he been an ironclad like obvious head coach yet? And I I understand that in a lot of cases it's white owners and white GMs that are, and it's it's sort of unconscious bias like. Sometimes you you just you hire people that look and act like you, and there is that issue in the NFL. Um, but I think yeah, I think we've covered Eric Bieniemy. I mean, well, he just we'll see. And Andy Reid and Pat Mahomes are what drives the Chiefs. How much of a role does Bieniemy play? Maybe we'll find out at some point. Yep. All right, we've got the rest of this list here, but you know who isn't a fraud? Federated Insurance. <laughs> right. Federated's been around for over a hundred years. They're ba- you should hire them right away. All right. To protect your business, risk management, all kinds of great resources and people to help navigate your business and make sure that you've got plans and structure in place for if bad things happen. So find out more at federatedinsurance.com. And remember, at Federated, it's our business to protect yours. Also, we are giving away winter classic tickets. The Wild (laughs) and the Blues are playing outdoors at Target Field on January 1st. And if you want, you can enter each of these five days this week. Score North app, listener rewards, and the code word is classic today. So just enter the code word classic on the Score North app, and you can be entered to win a pair of winter classic tickets. Awesome. And Judd, you are not eligible. We're sorry. Are you sure? Yes. Yes, very sure. Very sure. Have you checked all the rules? Yes, legal said so. Four times. Five. If you'd like to go dispute with legal, by all means, I I, I would actually pay. I can always get around them. Okay. Legal. Legal. All right. Let's keep going on this list here. Offensive-minded head coach candidates. We're just, we are there. Let's just do it. All right. 33-year-old Kellen Moore, offensive coordinator, Dallas Cowboys. Because of Dak, this is the write-up. Because of Dak Prescott's injury last year, some of Moore's forward momentum stalled, though not enough to stop him from interviewing with the Eagles last year. The 33-year-old former Boise State quarterback will be a head coach at some point. It might depend on how the Cowboys finish the season. A young coach recently removed from the game who can handle the rigors of a star quarterback and design a top-flight offense checks a lot of boxes. What's your score there, Judd? Again, Again, a ton of unknowns because of the age and the resume, which is which is impressive, but it doesn't it doesn't have um, some of the boxes that you'd like to see check necessarily. So I'm going to give him a seven. I, I'm going to say that I, he's with a, a franchise that certainly has had its ups and downs. Um, he's done a very good job. I'd be curious to know the involvement of his play calling completely because he he works for a guy who called plays in Green Bay and Mike you know Mike is is an offensive first guy himself. Uh, I'm going to give him a seven. That's fair. I mean, Declan is probably a ten and a half. Yeah, 11. it's an 11. Um, no, actually, it's a nine. It's a nine wow. for the simple fact that because he doesn't have a ton of NFL experience, but he's young, and this dude is a genius. In high school, he was designing and running his own plays as a starting quarterback in high school. What, what kind of high school quarterback gives their 17-year-old the privileges and the ability to run their own plays? He goes to Boise State. He's an absolute stud there. And he's been phenomenal with the Dallas Cowboys. I, I think he, maybe I'm drinking too much of that like young Sean McVay, Cliff Kingsbury Kool-Aid here a bit. But I think this is the perfect candidate. I think he can he can come in here and establish a modern NFL offense with this team. 
And to me, he's my priority number one. I, I, I can be talked in other interviews, but I think he's the guy I'm targeting the most this offseason. I, th- I feel like we're getting a little too like, well, he's a 33-year-old offensive guy, so therefore he must be Sean McVay. Like, we try to do this with everyone who's, like, in mm-hmm. their early to mid-30s and they're right. offensive guys, and, and so they must be Sean McVay and, or Matt LaFleur or whatever. Um, I'm like a seven. I'm not quite where Declan is, but I'm very interested. I, I do love the idea of a quarterback mind coming in, understanding how to get the most out of Kirk Cousins, if Kirk Cousins is still here, or whoever the Vikings may draft. You know, the fact that he has helped mold Dak Prescott into a really good franchise quarterback is appealing. Again, there's a big difference, though, between molding a quarterback and working as a position coach and an offensive coordinator and being a mastermind and leading a locker room of men and coaches, right? And all the media and things that goes like there's such a like Judd said it earlier. There's such a leadership thing here that we don't know about almost all these guys. And really, like no one knows until you put them in that role. Do they rise up and become charismatic enough? And, right. you know, can they can they navigate relationships and things like that so i'm like a seven so so far uh in terms of composite score here our level of interest we are the most interested in kellen moore collectively but let's get to this one 41 year old byron leftwich offensive coordinator tampa bay buccaneers here's the si.com write-up leftwich was a bit of a forgotten part of tampa bay's super bowl run last year with many people incorrectly assigning all the credit to tom brady and quarterback whisperer bruce arians The story of that season, though, came down to someone's ability to combine what Brady was comfortable with with what Arians was comfortable with and what the league's defenses were susceptible to and molding it all together. And uh, and I've even heard a couple interviews where Bruce Arians has said, I don't really do anything. I don't even go to the offensive meetings. Byron runs everything offensively. Um, and, And Arians has been livid that Leftwich didn't receive any head coaching interviews last year. And he's made it clear that uh, Leftwich would be a great option as a head coach. So he's got the backing of Arians. Again, he's Tom Brady's offensive coordinator, and so it's like, how much credit do you give him? So, Judd, what's your level of interest? I've been pretty boring so far, so I'm going to go. I'm, I'm going to turn the dial up a little bit here. I'm going to give him an eight, and here's why. Ooh. I'm going to I'm going to give him an eight, and here's why. First of all, uh, Leftwich himself played quarterback in this league uh do you guys remember and, and look i mean this is just completely spitballing but as far as, as getting people to uh play for you and rallying people together the famous shot of when Le- leftwich was at marshall and i think he broke his leg or something ha- happened and he wouldn't leave the field and he and the offensive line carried him to the next play yeah and and so I'm going to tie that together with the Brady effect by association. So, so like if he is, if he is as smart as he seems to, to be as well, and he's soaking up things, right. And he's learning things and he's got that intangible where he wasn't a great player himself, uh, but he, he was good enough to play in the league. Um, and he's working with really smart people. But like, I think part, so the incredible thing is this, I think part of the Belichick trees, failure is is he has and it works great as assistant coaches robots like i think mcdaniels is a offensive genius but i think he's got less people skills than stella um (laughs) um matt patricia can't wait to see steve belichick's people skills as a head coach exactly but i mean that's exactly it um but you know patricia right patricia is, is a genius he's got like an mit degree but he has no people skills Leftwich to me seems to be like a guy who probably has people skills, can lead, know what it takes to lead, and is soaking up things and is doing a good job. I'm very curious. He intrigues. I can, me. yeah, I'm I'm at about a seven with him too. Um, he, it's honestly it's different from Kellen Moore from the fact of like Byron Leftwich was actually a, a semi decent NFL quarterback. You know, Kellen Moore was clearly going to be a backup guy, even though he had a prolific career at Boise. Um, but but Leftwich was a first round pick, a top ten pick, and then was also with the Arizona Cardinals as a, as a head as an offensive coordinator and an interim status. I think he's definitely got some offensive principles that would apply. Um, I think he might have to wow in an interview to get the job. 
but I wouldn't be surprised if he does wow. Like I, I, yep. I wouldn't be surprised at, at all if, if he was able to wow the Wilfs or Spielman or whoever's conducting the interview process as this is our guy. I can be talked into him being the next head coach of the Vikings, definitely. And don't don't forget Tomlin because that's exactly what Mike did too. Be because that that entire thing was well, we gotta we've gotta s- satisfy this rule, and then Tomlin shows up and blows their socks off. It's mm-hmm. funny you bring up Tomlin. So I'm I'm an eight here. I'm an eight here. I thought I was going to be a lone wolf, and you guys are almost as optimistic as I am. I love it when guys, when when head coaching candidates are around a lot of smart, great people. Now, it doesn't mean that they are destined to be smart, great people, too, but at least they have an ability to soak things in. And uh, as a quarterback, as a backup, Byron Leftwich spent three years with the Steelers mm-hmm. under Mike Tomlin. And I, I think Mike Tomlin is one of the five best coaches of the last 25 years. He's just, he's adaptable. Uh, he's never finished below 500, I don't think. I, nope. I, unless last year, did they win seven games last year? But like no, they 15 would. years, he's never had a train wreck season, yeah, basically. they were 11 and 0 last year. So he, so Leftwich has been able to work with Arians, with Tomlin, with Brady. He sees and knows what championship football looks like. He sees and knows himself and through Tom Brady, what great leadership looks like at the quarterback position. And I think he'd be able to get more out of Cousins. I think he'd be able to get something out of a young quarterback. Again, there's a bust percentage with all these guys, but there's a lot to like about Byron Leftwich, even though his his like hockey stick growth as a head coaching candidate has been because he's associated with Tom Brady and a Super Bowl that Tom sure. Brady helped win. So, mm-hmm. But I, I'm really interested. Uh, 45-year-old... Josh McDaniels, offensive coordinator, New England Patriots. Uh, Here's the sense of what's going on with McDaniels, according to SI.com. Like a former vice president mulling a run for office, he has an idea of what the entire operation would look like if he chose to go all in. And then he can hire all of his assistants and back out like he did with the Colts. So, Josh McDaniels. You know, his go-around in Denver... which is now quite some time ago, was a disaster because he had no people skills. He loved Tebow, which is still odd to like. I I I, I never got weird. that. I never got that one. Super um, weird. I didn't think that the the college talents were trans translatable to the National Football League. But the thing with the Colts brings me down to like a three. Um, when you take a job and you hire and you start to hire your assistants and then back out that's to me a red flag because like that's a personality thing like there's something weird there like like that wasn't a the colts rescinded their offer or or it, uh changed things drastically because that's fine then if you decide that you don't want the offer i'm going down to a three though i that really really would concern me and i don't I don't know that this is a case of McDaniels maturing from his time in Denver since he decided to back out of the Colts thing. Um, I am highly doubt his people skills qualify him to be a head coach, so I'm pretty much out. Three. Yeah, it's a one for me. I, I really don't want anything to do with this guy. Uh, what he did with the Colts I thought was extremely immature. I thought his tenure and time in Denver was also a disaster. Um, there's a reason why a lot of these guys end up going back to Bill Belichick. And and yes, Bill Belichick is an, an, the maybe the best coach of all time of any sport that's ever been played. But a lot of these guys go back to Bill because it's comfortable and Bill knows what he gets out of them. And then once they leave Bill, things go completely awry. And for him to spur the Colts like that, I want nothing to do with that kind of guy with the Vikings. So to me, I'm, I'm, I don't even want to interview him. To be honest, yeah, it's uh, it's so hard because I kind of feel like he could be what Bill Belichick was to Bill Parcells, which is like a loyalist who stayed, maybe even turned down some opportunities to stay as a coordinator. Um, I'm higher than you guys. I'm like a six with McDaniel's, but I wow. understand. I understand that he might be a sociopath who's just yeah. meant to work for Bill Belichick for <laughs> the rest of his life. Right, That's where I'm at. So I'm like a six. All right. And the final one here, offensive-minded head coaching candidates for the Vikings, 53-year-old Doug Peterson. Now, this wasn't part of the SI.com article because this was more about coordinators, but he's taking a gap year. He got fired from Philadelphia last year. Two division titles in five years with Philadelphia, a Super Bowl win over the Patriots. 
He helped develop Carson Wentz into an MVP candidate before the injury. And he helped turn Nick Foles into a Super Bowl MVP. Now, he wasn't alone. He had a great coaching staff. Things blew up on him. But what's your level of interest in Doug Peterson? There's some intrigue here, but there's also some problems. My level on Doug Peterson is a five. It's not that high. Um, I love what he did with Carson Wentz initially, but that went sideways and, and he didn't seem to have a response. Um, the fact that he seemed to lose the locker room so quickly after a championship was intriguing. And I don't know, know why, uh, personnel wise, which he would definitely have a say of some sort, uh, you know, he, he wouldn't be the GM, but he would have a say of some sort also concerns me. Because he is one of the reasons that that the Eagles passed on Jefferson, which yeah, is they a, drafted Jalen Rager in yeah. the spot right before Jefferson. I mean, and that's that's not a small miss; that's an enormous miss. Um, and if he sees talent like that, I guess my question is just the full scope. How how do you judge things? Because that's a like Justin Jefferson's right there. Just take him, and you're like, ah, this guy's better, and I don't like that. Uh, yeah. I'll go a five. Uh, this this one, I would definitely talk to him. This one though doesn't like push me towards. Yeah, I think that this guy's going to come back and pop again. To me, it's a seven. Um, I, I'm definitely bringing in this dude for an interview. He took Nick Foles to the Super Bowl. I'm not a big Carson Wentz guy in general. Um, I, I think he's kind of seems like a difficult dude to work with. To be completely honest, just judging by how he carries himself. But I think Doug Peterson has surrounded himself with Andy Reid. He was the OC with them in Kansas City as well. The dude definitely knows offense, and Philadelphia is a tough place to coach. Um, so I'm definitely bringing him in for an interview. And in terms of experience-wise, of all these guys, I think he has the most credibility by far. I mean, yeah, he has a Super yeah. Bowl to his to his to his name, but he he would probably be if you listed all these guys, which one has the best chance to be the next Vikings head coach of all these candidates? Phil just laid out. He's number one. He's number one. Here's the thing. Nothing Judd said is wrong because all of those things happened or are questions. Like the he did he did train wreck at the end. His relationship with Carson Wentz went awry. And he was part of the, the decision makers that saw Jalen Rager a notch or two above Justin Jefferson. But all of those things happened after he won a Super Bowl. Mm-hmm. So if he can come in, if he's let's say he's a short shelf life guy, I don't care. If you can bring the Vikings to a Super Bowl in the first three or four years and then light the bridge on fire, cool. <laughs> I'm here for it. So I'm an eight on Doug Peterson. So we're kind of all over the – Declan and I are high on Doug Peterson. Notice how no, none of us really – Declan had a nine on Kellen Moore. None of us were a ten. None of us were like a zero or a one because it's hard to tell. Like you're, it's oh, a yeah. gamble. There are no sure things. The sure things, yes, are Sean Payton, Bill Belichick, Mike Tomlin, and I guess if by some unforeseen circumstance there's a falling out with one of those top guys, like but but you're you know you're rolling the dice. So the in the end, the ones that we are collectively the most interested in, it's a tie between Byron Leftwich and Kellen Moore. And then uh, Doug Peterson is third, and Eric Bieniemy is fourth. That's the that's the consensus here on Mackie and Judd for offensive minded head coach candidates. That's probably fair. That's fair. Yeah, um, yeah it's and and I, I guess part of the question too will be if they change GMs, what direction do they go there, and and then who does that person know, right? Because that if, if you do, and, and I think that you should, if you blow the entire thing up, um, you're going to have the question of you're, you're almost certainly still going to go with an with an offensive minded coach. But who does the new GM know? And d- does he have, you know, biases or a list? And it's hard to say. But I mean, I think more and more in this discussion, this is why it's time to, to just hit the reset button completely. Yeah. Yep. So. Oh, I'm sure that won't be the last time we bring a similar list to the table. We're going to have a GM list at some point, hopefully. Oh, yes, to talk we will. about. We're going to have come on, baby. So, all right. Every Tuesday,